So, 2020 has come to an end, or is coming to an end, almost, the year is almost over. Um, when I worked in child welfare, we, um, we often would joke about situations that were really quite serious. And people looking at us might say, what a morbid sense of humor these people have. But we used to say, if you don't laugh at this kind of thing, it's going to drive you crazy. And anyone that's worked in situations where they, uh, where there's high stress and high tension, they understand that, that even though sometimes the humor might seem a little inappropriate, uh, it's, it's a way to relieve some of the stress that one might be feeling. So I'm going to begin today's service with a little bit of humor about 2020. Uh, please don't be offended by it. If, if uh, you think you, this isn't anything we should joke about, I would, uh, I'm only doing this in fun. And so, uh, as I said, please, please don't take offense at anything that I would say today. So, first of all, I'd like us to think a little bit about uh, February 2020. Do we remember what that was like? Well, in February, February of 2020, Corona was a Mexican beer. In February of 2020, if you walked into a bank wearing a mask, someone would call 911. In March 2020, if you walked into that same bank not wearing a mask or wearing a ma not wearing a mask, someone might also call 911. In February 2020, COVID was not even a word. In February of 2020, social distancing had more to do with bad breath than about a virus. In February of 2020, you actually had to be absent to vote with an absentee va ballot. And in February of 2020, Zoom was the sound that a race car made. So uh, I'm going to show a little video here. And again, I don't mean to make light of a difficult situation, but when I first saw this in April, this, this video goes back to April, I, I thought it really summed things up. And what you see here, it's a comedian. Some of you may have seen this before. It's, it's gone viral. But... Um, uh, she is doing a little scene with herself in which her January self is talking to her April self. So it's like uh, she's sitting there in January and then she comes, she comes a premonition of what it would be like in April. Again, please don't be offended by this. It's really just meant to be uh, humorous. Oh, whoa. Who are you? I'm Julie from Four Months in the Future. Actually? Are you here to tell me what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because of the, the butterfly effect, I can only really give you um, some loose details, but we'll go through the basics, yeah. Okay, cool. So, do you want the good news or the b bad news? Oh, um, good, good news? Yeah, oh, yeah, great choice. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Um, so, things have never been better for climate change. No, that's great. Dolphins in the Venice Canals. Really? I know. I know. Well, it's, I, I, I mean, I saw it on Facebook. I don't know if it's a real thing. My aunt posted it, but it seems pretty legit. Oh. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's incredible. You know, especially given the Australian wildfires. The what? Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, those are pretty, like, I think those are going to be the defining feature of 2020. Yeah, you'd think. Oh, no? Not even a little bit. Really? Wait, because they're... They're a pretty big deal. Yeah, your definition of a pretty big deal is going to change for sure. Wow. Okay, so what is the bad news then? You are going to want to pull all your investments. What? Yeah, just yeah, get everything out of the stock market. Ugh, oh. Get it all out. Oh, it's a recession. You know what? Put a little money in Zoom. Isn't that a conferencing app? Yes, trust me. Okay, while we're being proactive here, actually, if you could just do a Costco run real quick. That's gonna save you a lot of hassle. Costco. Do you have any hobbies? You know, just something to something to keep you busy. Um, I no, not really. You should get a dog. I want a dog. You know, I want a dog. I just they're they're really, they're a lot of work, and you've got to walk. You got to go outside with them twice a day. Right. The walks are gonna be clutch. Right. But I mean, I have to leave them because I have so much travel coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. Well, yeah, I drop for work. Oh, you won't be working. But how do I afford stuff? Do you take vitamins? 
or juice no okay it might be it might be a good time to just you know get get that body in tip-top shape get 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 strong get those lungs a pumping you know cardio little aerobic what the hell is gonna happen look i know it all sounds scary but it's really not that bad you know for you right i mean for some people it's it's not but for you it's it's really not bad um i i would uh, you know, would you rather be in a busy shopping mall or at home on the couch watching Netflix? The couch? Exactly. You can be just fine. Okay. What do you know about the world of big cats? Sorry if the sound was not quite uh, what it should be. So anyway, so that's a, a little bit of a humorous look at the past year. Every true follower of Jesus Christ at some point has come to understand that they are sinners separated from God by disobedience. When we put our faith in the gospel message that Jesus died on the cross for our sins to pay the penalty which God's justice and righteousness demands, at that moment, we become new creations in Christ. We're born again. We are children of God. That crucial decision can take place at, at any point in life. For many of us, we were blessed to have made that decision as young children. And we've spent nearly our entire lives in a relationship with the living God. For others, it might have come later as teenagers, as adults. Uh, some even make that decision on their deathbeds and are immediately ushered into the arms of the Savior. At whatever age it takes place, it's the same for all of us. The circumstances differ, but what God does is, is the same for everyone who truly comes and trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Something clicks at some point in our life, something clicks in our thinking, and we recognize our need that we are separated from God and we deserve punishment for our disobedience to the laws of God. We hear the message of how God bridged that gap by sending his son to earth, that God's son, Jesus, lived a perfect and sinless life and he was rejected by his people, and he was nailed to a Roman cross, and he cru was crucified, and upon him, God poured out his wrath and the punishment for all of humanity's evil. And for all that disobedience, the punishment was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, after being placed in a grave on the third day, the Lord rose from the dead. At the moment of faith, regardless of our age, regardless of the circumstances, our background, or the heinousness of our sin, we are forgiven. We are identified with Christ's death and resurrection, and we become eternally children of God, who will never be separated from his love. However, our relationship with the Lord is not just limited to a knowledge of the gospel and assurance of eternal life. Each individual who becomes a child of God through faith in the gospel is then expected by God to embrace a worldview which is consistent with divine truth. That truth which has been revealed in God's word. And that revelation is found in the written record, the Bible. A worldview is a filter through which a person understands the entirety of our existence. It is a set of presuppositions which a person holds based on what they understand to be the source of truth. And these basic tenets then become the framework through which all the important questions of life are answered. A Christian thinker that has been important and played an important role in my life regarding this understanding of worldview was Chuck Colson, the founder of Prison Fellowship. That's the ministry that we partner with when we do the Angel Tree Project. He understood that many of the social problems in our contemporary society, the they are the result of people living their lives 
with either a faulty or incorrect worldview or simply following their desires and emotions and not living with any kind of consistent worldview at all. Colson was able to simplify our understanding of worldview by distilling it down to four fundamental questions which answer these basic issues of life. He would then say that only the Christian worldview answers these questions in a way which provides a rational and reasonable way to live, which is consistent with reality. These four questions are, where did we come from? What went wrong? Or it's another way of saying, what's the reason for suffering and evil, the problem of, of, of evil in the world? What is the solution to the problem? And then the fourth question, he words it as, uh, what is our purpose? But I like to think of it as, how should we now live? How do we take this information and move forward with it? And these questions are answered in, in a variety of ways by differing worldview systems. There's different religious systems, there's different philosophical systems, whatever a person adheres to. But it's the biblical worldview that we follow and that provides really the only true legitimate answers to these questions. First of all, we ask ourselves the question, where did we come from? We were created by a loving and all-powerful God created in his image. And thus, each human being, because we are created in the image of God, each human being has inherent and infinite value in the sight of God. What went wrong? Well, the scriptures tell us that humanity disobeyed God's express and revealed will, acted in rebellion, and subsequently the entire world has come under a curse, thus resulting in evil behavior and universal suffering. What is the solution? The answer to the problem of evil is the plan of God to provide redemption and reconciliation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sin, for our disobedience, and to make it possible for each person with faith in the gospel to experience regeneration and new life through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within them. And then, what is our purpose or how do we live? Our purpose is to bring honor to the God who created us and to do so by living in a manner which is consistent with his will as it has been revealed to us through his word, the recorded word of God, the Bible. Of course, when we embrace the biblical worldview, it should impact every aspect of our lives. We interpret all of our existence through the interpretive lens of scripture, and we adjust our attitudes and our actions accordingly so as to be living a life which is consistent with the revealed will of God. So let's look at 2020 now through this biblical worldview and see if it helps us understand a little bit about what has gone on. So this brings us here to the year 2020 and we should see, we should view this year through the lens of this biblical worldview, the events and the circumstances of this year have been unique and unprecedented, at least within our lifetimes. And it, of course, has been challenging times, but it is during challenging times such as this that we need more than ever to draw upon the resources that God has given us. And that begins with this understanding of all of reality, the worldview that we hold. We can and all of us should be drawing upon the, the unseen and intangible spiritual resources that we have through the presence of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. We know that God lives within us. We know that he is here and he gives us a strength during these most difficult times. And we simply can rest in the knowledge that we are God's children, that we are cared for. We have hope and our burdens can be cast on the Lord. And God has promised us that he will give us a peace that is beyond human comprehension. This is intangible. This is subjective truth that we know from the scriptures. 
a subjective reality that we feel. And such reliance on God's ability to bring calm in the midst of the storm is an essential part of the Christian life. This affects us on an emotional level, which transcends logical explanation. However, there is also a need for us to clarify and interpret the seemingly randomness and irrationality of this year and what it has brought in our lives and all of the stress and the tension and the pain and the suffering that so many people have experienced this year. And so while, yes, we have the we have the emotional and the intangible presence of God to give us peace. It's also important for us to look at this intellectually and to try to interpret what has been going on. What is it about the world that has caused the situation that we've had to deal with in the last 12 months? We can explain much of this year and how we react to it through the lens of a biblical worldview, which we embrace and which then gives us meaning and direction in our lives. When we face such an unsettling and uncertain condition as we have this year, we need to turn in our relationship to Jesus Christ and to his word for guidance and assurance and to a place, uh, place things into perspective, interpreting these, uh, this apparent chaos through the lens of our biblical worldview. So I want us to look at 2020 through Colson's four worldview questions and see what the meaning is and what comfort we can gain from it. First of all, where did we come from? Well, of course, we know that one. The first question is, is quite obvious. It hasn't changed because of the circumstances of, of um, 2020. We still recognize as believers, as Christians, that we were created by a loving and an all-powerful God. Now, that whole world doesn't share that perspective. I want, to, I want to share with you something that I received just this last week. As many of you know, I teach English to young Chinese children in the mornings. It's a part-time job that I do. And in one of the lessons, it was about the American holiday of Thanksgiving. And there was a writing assignment for these two children in that class that I, that I teach, in which they were to, at, to answer the question, what are you thankful for? Now, keep in mind, this sweet 10-year-old girl is being raised and indoctrinated under the atheistic communist system that is ruling China today. And this is what she said after correcting it for grammar and a few other Issues, but this was the point of what she what she said. When we ask ourselves this first question, where do we come from? This is a 10-year-old girl writing. She says, I think I am thankful for all the chance that has happened in the universe. For example, the earth was made by the dust and rocks that were hit by the sun. If this had not happened, there would be no earth. And many millions of years ago, an asteroid hit the Earth so that life started to reproduce on Earth. If this had not happened, there would be no humans, no you, no me. Imagine how bleak and meaningless the world would be if this young girl's worldview were in fact true. If our existence were only the result of chance interactions of atoms and the forces of physics and chemistry, what motivation would there be to hope for anything or to desire for, for this life to even continue? Such a worldview states that there is no guidance, there is no purpose, there is no right and wrong. Everything is completely and totally directionless. We would have no immortal soul, and as individuals, we are nothing but matter with no inherent value whatsoever. Then how would 2020 look if one embraced such a perspective? On the one hand, the pandemic would be nothing but a random mutation of a virus, and one would not need to try to explain God's role in what's taking place. However, the death and the suffering it caused would be then seen as nothing but culling the herd, only natural selection and survival of the fittest. Seeking to mitigate the death deaths of the weak and the vulnerable would not only be counterproductive, it would, could be argued that it would be wrong because such selection is how the species becomes stronger and how, how we gain resistance from future infections. And so by, 
the fact that we understand that we are created in the image of God completely changes how we even approach what has taken place in the world. It's because of the fact that we value the life of each individual that we treat each one as being created in the image of God. And that's why we do so much to preserve the life of someone who has contracted the virus and needs medical attention. It is precisely because of times such as 2020 that we need a biblical worldview which affirms the value of human life. If our origins are nothing but chance and random activity, so would our entire life. It would, it would have absolutely no meaning. Likewise, our life would be meaningless and our demise, our end, would be equally meaningless. Recognizing the biblical explanation of the origin of the universe and humanity is the only reason we have any motivation to be compassionate and to care for the weak and the infirm around us. So the answering this question from a biblical worldview in 2020 is vitally important. We are created in the image of God. We have inherent value. God loves us. And that's why we work so hard to try to preserve the lives of those that are suffering as a result of what's taken place. Then the second important worldview question that Colson proposes is what went wrong, which essentially addresses the problem of evil and suffering in the world. And this too is a matter which must be answered by a biblical worldview. 2020 has certainly proven, if anything else, it's proven that there's something wrong. Something has gone wrong in the universe. The fact that a tiny microbe can spread from person to person and cause widespread death and suffering demonstrates that there is something that is not right in the world in which we live. However, it is not the coronavirus and its devastating impact on our lives, which has been evidence of what that, that evidence that something has gone seriously wrong, but it's as much the reaction of humanity that has confirmed the fact that the world is in fact broken. It's not surprising that people disagree about the nature of what we've been experiencing. Part of the reason that there are so many differences of opinion is that even as we are nearly a year into this pandemic, there are still more questions than there are answers surrounding the nature of what is taking place. Debate still continues exactly about exactly how the virus spreads. I mean, we have a lot of information, more than we did before, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. There's debate about the efficacy of different measures to mitigate its spread the overall impact that the lockdowns and other extreme actions have had on the, on the well-being and the, and the mental health of those who are suffering from isolation. With such important and impactful issues being unresolved in people's minds, it's only natural to expect differences of opinion and healthy debate. What has demonstrated in 2020, however, the reality of the problem of evil has been the way it has divided people in such vitriolic ways in which we find ourselves demonizing one another, demonizing those that might hold a different opinion from what we have. We have become so polarized in our reactions to people who hold different opinions that we become angered and, and certain that those people with opposing views clearly have bad intentions. They have the worst possible intentions. What 2020 has brought out in all of us is the reality of the sin nature. One that has it, that, that we have within us, that, that uh, we want to turn on our neighbors and, and only see the worst in them. This is, this is seen, this was seen even clearer than later on in the year as the summer went on and the violence and the civil unrest exploded in our cities. The violence itself was clear evidence of evil in the world. And there is certainly no justification whatsoever for those who destroyed property and, and in some cases even killed people. However, once again, what was confirmed, what confirmed the reality of the sin nature in all of us is the way in which we turned against one another. We postured ourselves so that we made 
those who disagree with us are enemies and allowed sentiments of hatred, distrust, and resentment to overwhelm our emotions. What the fighting and division has proven is that sin is real. It confirms what the biblical worldview tells us, which says that the perfection of the world, which existed before the disobedience of humanity, was disrupted by the deliberate rejection of God's will. The result was that God's holiness demanded justice, and that because of that justice, there was a curse that was placed on all the universe. Likewise, humanity became sinful by nature. Therefore, all of us have a propensity towards disobedience to God's will. That human inclination towards disobedience has been reflected in how our society has divided and fought against itself in this last year. Now, that sinful nature is not eradicated when we become believers. We wish it were, but Paul recognized that in himself in Romans chapter 7. He says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. And so even with regeneration, there are still the remnants of that old nature that continue to fight within us. Thankfully, God's Holy Spirit, praise to the Lord, God's Holy Spirit is there to counteract that. But it's still present, and it's still a battle that we face every day of our lives until we are called home to be with the Lord. Now, there is little that we can do individually about the division and the discord around us, which will inevitably continue into the next year. However, as I will discuss in a few minutes, we do have power as those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God to respond in a way that counteracts the inclinations of the old nature. We can't impact the world individually. We can't change what's going to be happening in the world, but we as individuals have the power to respond according to the will of God. And that's where we need to draw upon that strength. So then we ask ourselves the question, what is the solution? The third of these questions. The, and this, of course, this question is the center of the biblical worldview. This is the most fundamental of all of these answers. What is the solution to the problem? Essentially, every other worldview system offers one of two answers to this question. What's the solution? Whether it's other religious systems, secular materialism, Eastern mysticism, or even those that have no particular or specific worldview, they are going to answer this question in the same way. There are two responses of the alternative worldviews that are around us. They will either say, well, there's just nothing we can do. We just have to deal with it. That's the, that's the condition we're in. Or the second response is just try a little bit harder. But as we look at God's revealed word in the scripture, neither of these responses offers one bit of hope. We can just say there's nothing we can do about it. That's the way it is. Or we can say just try a little harder, a little bit more education, a little bit more money, a little bit more research. We're going to be able to solve this problem eventually. Those are the two answers. No matter what the, the other alternative worldview systems are, they are going to give you one of those two answers. There's either nothing we can do, just put up with it, or just try a little harder. You can do it if you work hard enough. However, in the biblical worldview, the answer of the problem of evil was addressed by God himself. We can say that all other worldviews are essentially anthropocentric, which means they are centered and focused on humanity. The biblical worldview is theocentric, which means it is centered around God himself. God created us. We disobeyed God's will. And God has provided the solution to our problems. Of course, this was done through what we had talked about earlier. This was done through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we said earlier in the message, when I gave that summary of the gospel, this solution restores our relationship with the God who made us. It also gives us a new nature 
a spiritual one which counteracts the remnant of the old nature which inclines us towards disobedience. The Christian answer to the problem of evil is not just that it gives us eternal life, and that, of course, is, is of great importance and, and gives us great comfort and joy, but it gives us a focus for where to approach the problem of evil in the very beginning. It starts with the new nature that we receive when we become a child of God. Yes, in the end, ultimately in the future, all of that's going to be done away with. There will be no more evil when, when we are in the presence of the Lord. But here and now, the answer that we have through the, through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, we understand that it gives us the power then to resist the evil around us, to resist the temptations and to overcome that as individuals. Of course, becoming a Christian does not make us exempt from the effects of the physical curse in the world. We're all going to get sick. We're all going to suffer from aging, disease, and injury, and everything else that, that, that the physical world has to go through. However, when we look to God's guidance and his guidelines, it's well documented that we can mitigate, just by following God's will, we can mitigate much of the physical suffering which comes from the fall just by living according to God's design. Everything from abstinence from harmful substances to the power of prayer and meditation that produces chemicals within our brain which counteract the, those other hormones that are associated with stress and, 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 uh, and fear. And as, as we allow God's power to overwhelm us, it, it actually calms our body and it's good on our, it helps us physically. It has tremendous physical benefits to be resting in the peace of God. That's been well documented by, by science. And so we see, of course, even in the physical realm, we can, to a certain degree, to a certain extent, we can mitigate the effects of the fall. We can mitigate the, the problem of suffering and evil in the world. But of course, spiritually, we rest and we rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit to help us individually say no to temptation, to say no to, to the desire to, for vengeance, to, to, for anger, for resentment, for all of the things that we've seen so evident in this past year, we can say no to that and we can look to the, to the spirit of God to, to give us strength. And we'll be looking at that in a moment. So as 2020 comes to an end, we understand that we need more than ever to rest on the hope of eternal life and rely more and more on the indwelling Holy Spirit to empower us to be more in tune with the Lord's will and to allow him to give us the strength to resist the influence of the old nature. The ancient solution to evil, the gospel of Jesus Christ, has never been more relevant and more needed than it is right now. And then what is our response or how do we live? The final question which, which Colson addresses is, is a very practical one. It's worded by Colson as, what is our purpose? However, I prefer to, to think of it more in a practical way, which would be, what is our response or how do we now live? Of course, the biblical worldview gives us the best and the clearest response to that of any other alternate system that, that, that is out there. It's the only true one, it's the only one that is consistent with truth and, and conforms to reality. A few weeks ago, I mentioned the first question in, in one of our sermons uh, a few weeks ago, the first question of the Westminster Catechism, which is, what is the chief end of man? The response to that question is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And this is done, we glorify God through yielding our will to the will of God, and we allow the life of Christ to be lived through us and to be seen by the world. So let me repeat that. What does it mean to glorify God? It means that we yield our will to the will of God, and we allow through the Holy Spirit for God to live the life of Jesus Christ through us so that it is evident to the world. And as they look upon us, they see 
the image of Jesus Christ reflected in our lives, in our attitude, in our words, in the way we respond to the world around us. And this is going to be as important in 2021 as it was in 2020. Perhaps more important in this coming year than it was in the previous one. The challenges of the coronavirus are not going to disappear immediately. January 1st is not going to be the end of, of all the, the difficulties that we've seen. Even with the possible rollout of a successful vaccine, we know that that in and of itself is going to take months before it will reach enough people to even make a difference. And that doesn't even take into consideration uh, any potential harmful side effects or, or unforeseen issues that might be associated with it. Therefore, as we enter this new year, the church, the body of Christ, must commit to responding to the upcoming circumstances by seeking the Lord's will as it is revealed in Scripture. I believe that the best place for the Christian to begin the search for God's will is to look in Galatians chapter 5, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Here, enumerated in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, these verses list nine individual qualities which collectively represent the evidence of the Holy Spirit's influence in the behavior of God's children. Listen to these. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what God desires of us. This, if you want a summary of the Christian life, what does it mean? How, how should we live as a Christian? Of course, there's many, many factors, many principles, many things we look to. But if you want it summarized in a very concise place, look at Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 at the fruit of the Spirit. That summarizes what the follower of Jesus Christ should look like to the world. Love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we seek to allow these characteristics to emanate from our lives to the onlooking world, we will be able to have a positive impact during what may be another one of the most challenging years that we will ever face. The world will be looking at us, the body of Christ, in 2021. We need to be faithful to bring the glory of God in our words, in our actions, in our attitudes to everyone we have contact with. About a year or so ago, I read a book that I've mentioned before in some of my messages that, that had a big impact in my thinking about the future of the gospel in America and around the world. The book is titled The Myth of the Dying Church. And it countered the conventional wisdom that droves of people in America are turning from God because uh, as, as pollsters have done these surveys, uh, particularly of young people, they see this increase in the number of, uh, of those who no longer identify with any specific religious tradition. So when asked uh, about their religion, there's a growing number of people, particularly young people, who will say none, that they have no religious affiliation. And that statistic is true. But according to the book about the myth of the dying church, what the pollsters have failed to, to factor in is that most of those who are responding, who say that they have no religious connection, really were only nominally affiliated in the first place with any church or denomination. They may have grown up in a mainline denomination that never emphasized or, or preached the scriptures or the gospel or the need for a personal relationship with God. And at that, they may have only attended occasionally once or twice a year. They had no real connection, but in the past, they would say, well, I was this or that or the other thing. But this new generation is willing to say, well, this has no real meaning to me. Maybe it was something my parents needed to cling to, but I can give it up. And so they, when asked, what is your religious affiliation? They simply say, None. And so what's happening is you're really just seeing a difference in the way people are able to verbalize their relationship to religion. 
And so people that never had a relationship at all with God are just simply acknowledging that now rather than going back to some legacy that they may have had from previous generations. However, what they have also found, what has also been found to be true is that churches that do preach the gospel, churches that hold to a biblical worldview, churches that admonish people to trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ for salvation actually are growing in this country. And that despite uh, all of the bad press that Christianity has received, there are still more people out there seeking truth and finding it in Jesus Christ than ever before. It doesn't feel that way. It doesn't seem that way. The statistics don't make it look that way, but that's really the, that's the reality. And that's important because people are always going to be looking. They're always going to have the need. It's never going to go away. There's always going to be individuals that are going to say, I need something right now. Whatever it is that's going on in their life, whether it's a tragedy, whether it's illness, whether it's financial hardship, whatever it is, people are going to realize that they've come to the end of their rope and they need to seek something, something more permanent, something real. And that's when the opportunity for the gospel to come into their life is, is, exists. And so the, the author, Glenn Stanton, then goes on to say that although many mainline denominations are losing adherence in droves, Non-denominational evangelical churches are growing significantly, and the body of Christ, uh, those who have a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, is actually increasing. It tells us that God is still on the move in America and around the world. However, overall, there is still a growing and more influential secular element to our society. Both of these rea realities are going on simultaneously, that more individuals are becoming believers in Jesus Christ, but also more people and in significant numbers are becoming more secular in their, in their outlook. And of course, that is going to have a significant impact on popular culture. But the truth of the gospel will continue to push back as individually people come to the realization of their need for salvation, and then the Holy Spirit indwells them and convicts them to open their hearts to the gospel and then yield their lives to the will of God. 2021 is going to be a time in which the Christian worldview will be more important than ever. The world may seem more dreary and hopeless than it ever has. However, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have no reason to be swept in by negative sentiments. Even as things may seem to be coming increasingly bleak, the follower of Jesus Christ still has the only true message that brings any hope. Think again of the, of the words of that, uh, of that uh, little Chinese 10-year-old girl. I am thankful for chance. I'm thankful that it happened. If it hadn't have happened this way, None, you know, I wouldn't be here. That is, that, that is her answer to, meaning, to the meaning of life, which is, of course, nothing. We, of course, understand that there is meaning to life. There is purpose. We were created to bring honor and glory to a living and a loving God. So let us approach this new year with enthusiasm and eagerness as we bring the good news to those who need to hear about it in this lost and sin-sick world. Now, as has been my tradition for 12 years now as the pastor of this church, I put together a, 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 fitting, a fitting summary to, to my years of service. Uh, 2020, I don't think I could have, uh, I could not have choreographed it, that's for certain. But we're going to look at, at some memories going all the way back to the beginning of the year. We're going to see the dramatic changes that have taken place. And we're going to see that God has been faithful. We've seen some hard times in our little congregation in the last 12 months. But God is still faithful. And he will remain faithful in 2021. So let's take a moment to reflect on the faithfulness of God in the year 2020. <laughs> 